Okay. So, um, yeah, is everybody back? Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, Thomas's question was about um, chapter fourteen and verse twenty-two. Right. Well, Paul is talking about uh, you know from verse twenty. Uh, he's talking about tongues and uh, tongues and and prophecy, uh, prophesying. And uh, verse twenty-two, you know, it reads like this. Therefore, tongues are for a sign. Okay, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. So, uh, the instance before that is uh, is talking about you know with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to these people, and yet for all that they will not hear me. Now that's a reference from Isaiah twenty-eight, right? Isaiah twenty-eight was eleven and twelve. Um, see, the one thing is the the uh, what Isaiah is actually talking about is in that uh, uh, in that uh, eleven and twelve, he's talking about. Um, God actually referring to another nation that's invading Israel, and uh, with another language, with another, you know, he's referring to the nation of Assyria, and uh, how the with you know it it was it, it sounded as if uh, it was uh, you know uh, if you look at Isaiah twenty eight with uh, talks about how twenty eight eleven with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to this people. Right? So um, Paul is quoting that. And also referring to uh, what happened at uh, the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, there was um, uh, the, the 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 praying in tongues that happened, which was known language, and uh, it was uh, something that pointed people uh, to God. Right. Um, well, whereas here uh, in in the Old Testament in Isaiah 28, we see that it was actually a, a, a reflection of God's judgment on Israel. Right. So, like God bringing in judgment uh, through this nation of Assyria and bringing in uh, judgment over Israel, and yet that that they would not listen. Right. Um, so uh, so that is uh, that is something that we see there. Um, and then, then Paul concludes, verse 22, he's saying, therefore, tongues are a sign. Okay. Now, for those who do not believe, tongues are a sign. I think you know, there's no problem in that, in understanding that, right? Tongues are for a sign. Um, so you know, in the Old Testament, it, yes, it was, a, it was a sign of judgment, bringing in God's judgment, a, a warning um, that uh, they were not doing something. Uh, you know, they were going astray, and God was bringing in judgment to that nation. Um, and so it was a sign. Here also, you know, we see in the New Testament church that uh, it was birthed by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that it is a sign uh, for the unbeliever about uh, pointing to Jesus. So it's a sign. And I think the second part of that verse is where uh, the the actual, you know, the complex thing is where it says, but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So obviously, you know, he's comparing uh, praying in tongues and prophesying and saying, but he says, but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. And what happens is after that verse, he talks about how if an unbeliever is exposed to prophecy, uh, you know, that person comes to comes to the Lord. Okay. But the, the verse, the second part of verse 22 says, prophesying is not for unbelievers. Uh, so that is the, uh, that is the complex thing. So a lot of people have tried to interpret it in different ways. Uh, you know, one is like prophecy uh, is not uh, is not you know one one is very plain. It's, it's not for unbelievers. As in, it, definitely pro an unbeliever will not prophesy. Uh, it's it's not prophecy does not come through an unbeliever. Uh, is you know, spirit is not born again, etc., which is very plain. And uh, but the difficulty of that is uh, that when he says prophecy is not for unbelievers, and then goes on to uh, explain in verse twenty-three how a per unbelieving person comes to church and uh, gets to hear a prophecy and comes to know the Lord. So um, it it is uh, you know if if that is what your question was, uh, Thomas, you know um, uh, it it is a kind of a complex. Uh, you know, uh, verse uh, where it is not clear. Actually, it's not very clear what that statement is referring to. It seems like a contradiction. You know, twenty-two and twenty-three. Um, but when we look at the context, when we look at scripture, we see that you know, tongues are a sign. You know, definitely, you know, tongues are a sign. Um, so that statement is true by itself. And 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 prophecy. 
when unbelievers are you know uh, have an encounter with god through prophecy um through the whole gift of prophecy being active that is also true so so the thing is that that aspect is not very clear you know why paul would say um um you know tongues are uh not for believers prophesy prophesying is not for believers but for those who believe so i uh, just need to spend more time on that uh, was that, that was your question right the second part of verse 22 yeah right right pastor because yeah, uh, the same. people okay. from the tradition churches those who are against the speaking in tongues they will mm-hmm. pick some of this like this verses this chapter especially in this chapter uh like mm-hmm. other words are with uh, uh, what uh, uh interpretation without the uh, interpretation you cannot speak uh, it they will take mm. like this 22nd words and this verse and all saying that they will but uh, in 22 verses i'm unable to summarize till today <laughs> that is why i asked that question because yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's difficult it seems uh, it seems a little <laughs> see we, though we understand you know uh, what paul is explaining in 22 in 23 24 we you know all those statements are you know true but um, yeah it, it's 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 a little difficult to uh, uh, yeah to really look at it you know what was what is it you know if prophesying is not for unbelievers uh, you know what is that statement actually uh, refer it's a difficult statement yes you're right yeah right but but the fact is that all the other statements are you know very very valid uh, because we see it as the church experiences that you know uh, tongues being a sign uh, prophesying uh again you know unbelieving uh, people coming to know the lord all that is very very valid uh, but it's this is a difficult statement you're right yeah <laughs> any other uh, questions um um about no, women pastor, being um silent as such no no questions okay about about women being silent in church you know i think that's that's very very clear but we just need to be clear about the context of you know ch- chapter 11 uh, about the rest of uh, you know i think uh, the romans last chapter is also a great chapter to go to because uh, romans chapter 16 paul actually lists down all the women who were in ministry who were serving you know in in various capacities as apostles as people um, you know uh, laboring in the gospel and so on so it wasn't like uh, you know uh, so it it, it if we saying okay using that verse and saying women cannot cannot be in ministry then that's obviously very very wrong and um, is a misapplication of truth right so um so that so this is the thing it's it, it's it's pointing to women who were married because he specifically says uh, women ask your husbands at home and you know like we know in uh, in, in even in in today in some traditional churches women you, you know sit separately men sit separately like there's a distance uh, jewish synagogues that, that is how it was so uh, probably even in the early church you know uh, in some of these you know gentile churches maybe they had that kind of a setup i mean i don't know i haven't studied that so which means you know when when a woman is when a wife is asking the husband the husband is sitting there you know across the aisle and uh, you know husband is wife is asking you know hey what does this mean i didn't understand and uh, so that causes confusion uh, causes uh, you know disturbance and he's setting in order right uh, be silent tongues no interpretation be silent but how to be silent you pray between you and god prophecy uh if you don't have any anything to prophesy be silent let the other speak um so this is how prophecy is and here is saying you know women you keep silent uh, be submissive ask your husband so specifically asking you know addressing the issue of um questions being asked and and disrupting the service and so on okay okay so uh, the other thing is also you know when it uh, when it comes to um you know uh like prophecy failing uh which was is that 13 okay um uh, yeah 13 and verse 8 you know love never fails but whether there are prophecies they will fail there are tongues they will cease there is knowledge it will vanish away you know that uh, i hope you understand the context of you know why he's saying that and uh, and also because many have taken that verse and misapplied it saying okay tongues have ceased prophecies have stopped 
okay um and uh, so therefore you know we have received what what is complete which is the word of god okay so that is that is a reference but actually he's saying you know uh, he goes on to say you know but then face to face now i see in a mirror then i see face to face um and he's talking about obviously uh, talking about um, a time when he will he will be known uh, and he says you know i shall know just as i also am known and i will encounter face to face so he's talking about time when you know, faith is complete you know it faith you know you don't you don't need these things anymore because uh, you're in the presence of god you're in the presence of jesus so you don't need these things anymore right so when it says that it says uh, when he says this it, it means that all this will come to an end okay but he's not talking about all these coming to an end right now because he goes on to continue that right? he continues on in chapter 14 to talk about how it should be used which means it's not con- it's not come to an end you know it is in operation but this is how it should be in operation in the church right okay uh, then another question could be you know um uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28, right? Um, God has appointed these in the church. And then verse 29, are all apostles, are all mirac- uh, prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, uh, do all speak in tongues? Uh, you know, that that is one of the questions, right? Do all speak in tongues? And uh, and obviously the, the answer is no, right? The answer is no. Uh, not all are apostles, not all are uh, prophets, and so on. The answer is no. So uh, so the answer to all the questions is no, right? Uh, but the thing is, he's talking about ministry appointments. You know, we need to understand that he's talking about ministry appointments in the church. God has appointed these in the church: uh, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, uh, administrations, varieties of tongues. He's talking about ministry, uh, ad, you know, offices, and he's asking, uh, are all doing this? No. They have different offices uh, because the one before that is the verse, uh, the, the passage before that is talking about uh, uh, about members of the body, you know, not comparing, not putting down the other, not elevating one, one person over the other. So he's talking about that. So in the light of that, he's talking about ministry offices. And obviously the answer is no. So sometimes the misapplication of that is, you know, I don't have, so let's say I have not yet received gift of tongues, then I'm just convinced that, okay, tongues is not for me. Okay, maybe some other thing. That person has gifts of tongues, I have something else. Right? But the fact is that the Holy Spirit, he is the one who has all these gifts. One spirit, different gifts. One spirit, different activities. And he is the one who dwells in us. Right? And he is the one who expresses himself in through us. So, in, at least in a couple of places, that is in verse 31, he says, earnestly desire the best gifts. Right? Meaning, what is the best gift for that particular challenge? What is for that particular problem? What is that particular occasion? Desire that gift so that the Holy Spirit might express himself through you in that manner, might manifest himself. And that will take care of that problem, whether it's healing, whether it's uh, encouragement, edification, exhortation, comfort that is required, uh, or a word of wisdom or a counsel, you know, that solves the problem. So you take, you know, it is taken care of. Earnestly desire the best gifts. Again, in um, chapter 14, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Right? So, so we know that it, you know, he's not talking about one person having this, the other person, but God wants to express himself through this. And But it, it requires our uh, understanding, right? Because if you don't, if you don't know that it's God's will for us or God's will for, uh, for the spirit to be uh, expressing himself through us in these ways, then we won't desire, right? We'll say, okay, it's not God's will for me. But then when we know that it's scriptural, it's God's will, then we can desire in faith. We can ask in faith. We can stand in faith saying, hey, God wants it for me. So who can stop it, right? So I can, I, I can desire. I can step out in faith and I can receive. So I desire knowing that God wants it for me. So, uh, so that's one of the other things, right? Okay. 
Okay, so uh, if there's uh, no other question, if there's any other, uh, maybe some some practical question, um, then we'll. Uh, if there's nothing, then we'll move on to uh, chapter fifteen, right? Okay. Okay, let's look at chapter fifteen. Okay. Um, so chapter 15, so he's done, you know, 14 is, 12 to 14 is talked about the gifts and, uh, you know, uh, he doesn't want people to be ignorant and is finished with that. So let's read 15. Uh, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. So he's... he's um, talking about something um, uh, and he's uh, you know expressing that this is the gospel that I received okay uh, this is the gospel that I preached to you this is the gospel that you believed and this is the gospel in which you stand okay so um, so he's saying that uh, um, he's talking about uh, first thing verse 3 he says Christ died for our sins and it was according to the scriptures. It was prophesied. It is mentioned in the Old Testament. And this is what you believe. So hold fast to it. Meaning, you guard it. You keep it secure. Okay, Don't let go of it. Just like we saw. No? Like hold fast to those things that you heard. So that you might not drift away. So he's saying hold fast. Have a hold grip on it. Understand it. Keep it secure. Uh, don't, uh, you know, don't be doubtful about it. Let it be firm and established in your heart. Okay, so um, which also means the reality of the fact that hey, any truth or any anything that's uh, that uh, that the that the Lord you know uh, when He brings His truth when He brings His word that there will be attempts to take that word out by the enemy or by circumstances, right? Or by you know some some of our own internal challenges. Okay. And that is very, very clear in Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower. The sower sows the word. Immediately, the birds of the air come and take it out. And we and the Lord Jesus explains that the seed is the word of God. So the enemy knows the potential of the word, and therefore the enemy comes to take away the word. Okay, So the Lord says, hold fast. Okay, Don't let the enemy take it. When we don't understand, when we don't... Uh, you know, when we, when it's just lying there without us engaging in faith or receiving the word, the enemy takes it. We forget it, right? And it 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 does not it does not take in root. It has not taken hold in our hearts. Right? And and also the other thing is we see that it does uh, you know sprout up, but the sun comes and then it's burnt away. Okay, why? Because the roots could not go down because of the kind of uh, the thing it was right? and the sun which came out scorched it referring to persecution right? there is a maybe you know some kind of a you know 
persecution because of what you believe in what you choose to believe in right persecution can be you know ridicule making fun of um persecution can be something even more severe like you know being arrested for your faith and etc et but but the thing is this because of persecution there's a you know it's an attempt again to take away the word right so the lord is saying you know lay, lay hold of that have a strong hold on that the other thing that we see in mark chapter 4 is that you know um uh, worries cares of the world desires lust for other things uh the and you know these are the things which actually crowd it's like the thorns the seed falling among thorns and the thorns choking the seed so it 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 is rooted but there are other things the environment you know uh, we've allowed the environment allowed the cares of the world allows the you know the lusts of the flesh maybe or the desires of other things like pride and and other things um take presidents or you know over power or we let let them go higher than the truth of god's word and so they choke god's word right and then it talks about the good soil where it falls and then you know 30 60 100 fold so the thing is that we must hold fast so that is what paul is saying you know he's saying uh, you know i delivered this that Christ died for us uh, for our sins according to the scriptures right verse 2 he says you are saved if you hold fast that word which i preached to you okay so he's ex- explaining that um this is what that he died according to scriptures that he was buried he rose again according to scriptures so all this has been already prophesied it is based on the word and receive this gospel i share this gospel to you okay so for paul it was a sovereign that he received right he had this encounter and he's you know spending this he was blind he was spending the time in prayer uh, spending the time uh, and then ananias comes and you know, prays and by that time he has already accepted the lord and as comes and says brother saul and the lord has told me to come and lay hands and pray that you may receive your sight you know he prays he receives his sight he's baptized in the holy spirit right immediately he is baptized all that happened and and the lord revealed the son in him um it came by revelation you know galatians chapter 1 verse 16 says uh, but it pleased god verse 15 uh, but when it pleased god who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his in me that i might preach the right i'm sorry i might preach him among the gentiles so there was a revelation of the son in him that he might preach that revelation to the gentiles so he received that uh gospel message and he shares that with the corinthian church and he's saying that which i received i shared right and uh, he was buried he rose again according to the scriptures and then verse 5 on where he says these were the witnesses he was seen by peter he was seen by sif as you seen by the 12 he was seen by over 500 people at once and he was seen by james he was seen by all the apostles then he was seen by me also right he was seen by me also and i am the least of the apostles he says why the reason is he persecuted the church he's saying so i am the least of the apostles i persecuted the church but by the grace of god i am what i am okay and uh, because of this grace of god he says i labored all the more i worked all the more i put i put in more effort because of the grace of god this grace was god upon me this you know he's referring to the revelation that he received he's referring to those um, you know the favor that was upon him to go and plant churches to go and preach the gospel uh, to all these uh, you know surrounding regions so the grace of god was upon him to do that to enable him to do that but it was not just you know okay because of the grace of god i can sit back and relax no he says i labored all the more right i worked all in fact he says i labored more than they i put in more effort because of the grace of god that was upon me okay so there's another lesson for us the grace of god comes upon us um, the god has given us and graced us with maybe you know certain gifts and abilities uh, which is indicator that well 
it is something that we need to you know for us to move in and and put in that effort and labor right so so he's uh, he, so what is it? so paul is saying that you know i whether it was i or they so we preached and so you believe okay so all these eyewitnesses were there the apostles the, the even some of them like 500 uh, brethren right so many people who who are eyewitnesses so the fact is that you know if there were so many eyewitnesses and if they would testify then you know it would hold up in a court of law right something like this so you know you hold on to it right don't let go of it we preached and so you believe what was that preaching the whole thing that he died for the sins he was buried he rose again okay now now he goes on and from verse 12 he goes on to say be very specifically you know, that there was a there was a problem in the what they believed in and what some of the messages that were being preached okay so he goes on to say this verse 12 now if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead so that is the issue right so he's talking about the fact that there, there were people uh, you know who are witnesses of the resurrection you know so many people are there and uh, you know i had that encounter as well as a as a last of or least of all the apostles you know i had this encounter i've seen uh, i've seen the lord and you know uh, because of the grace of god i labor more than them and uh, i am what i am by the grace of god now all this has happened now, when if christ is preached that he rose from the dead and it is not because you know it is and and that day and time the the eyewitnesses are preaching that um, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead okay let's read verse 13 but if there is no resurrection of the dead then christ is not risen and if christ is not risen then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty yes and we are found false witnesses of god because we have testified of god that he raised up christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise for if the dead do not rise then christ is not risen and if christ is not risen your faith is futile you are still in your sins then also those who have fallen asleep in christ have perished if in this in this life only we have hope in christ we are of all men the more there was some kind of a, a preaching some kind of a message um, that that was happening, uh, that was being uh, preached in the church. Um, they, they were saying that you know uh, the dead do not rise. Okay, uh, so obviously uh, you know we don't know whether they were saying Jesus did not rise, but definitely you know they were saying that de the dead do not rise, right? So so then he's saying you know if there is no resurrection, he's explaining to the church that if there is no resurrection, just think about it, then Christ did not rise from the dead. And if Christ did not rise from the dead, then our faith is futile, right? And we are actually false witnesses of God. We are saying God raised up, the Father raised up um, the Son from the dead and resurrected the Son. And we are actually false witnesses. You know, the dead do not rise at all. Then Christ is not risen and our faith is futile. And, the, and if Christ did not rise from the dead, which means that we are still in our sins because of the very fact that he rose from the dead means that that the sins were dealt with that he destroyed the body of sin right and they are no more and the perfect sacrifice has been paid and you know everything is it's, it's wiped clean but now if you're saying that he did not rise from the dead that means that we are still in our sins just think about it okay so he's saying you know logically he's just 
proving to them, you know, you're saying the dead do not rise. If you're saying that, then Christ is not risen. If Christ did not rise from the dead, that means that we are we who are preaching are found to be false witnesses. You know, we are claiming to be uh, or claiming to state an account to be true that God did something which He did not, because they are all believed in God, right? So God did something that which He did not, and we are false witnesses. And if Christ did not rise from the dead, which means that we are still in our sins. And one more thing he says, you know, if we are all this faith and, you know, everything that we have is only for this life, okay, that there is no eternal life. It, it, if it is only for this life, all the struggles that we are going through, that, uh, you know, that all the uh, things that we are going through, all the difficulties that we are going through, and uh, for the sake of the faith, and we are going there and preaching the gospel and everything, right? Um, he's saying, you know, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men the most pitiable. Okay, because it's you know really we are we are we are more we are pitiable because the good news is not for this earthly life only. The good news is that. It affects eternity, right? Our eternity. So, saying you know we are most pitiable, who are believing like this, who are living like this, who are going through these challenges, who are you know uh, going through these difficulties, just till this lifetime. You know we are of men, you know all men the most pitiable. And before that, he says you know those who have uh, those who have fallen asleep, you know those who have died. In Christ, then there, which means that's that's it. They're, everything has come to an end with that death, right? This means they they have perished, right? So he's saying that. You just think about what you're saying. You know, if you're saying that there is no resurrection from the dead, all this is is true. All these things are true. Is that what you're saying, right? We have become of all men the most pitiable. Verse twenty onwards but now christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die even so in christ all shall be made alive but each one in his own order christ the first fruits Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father. Uh, when he puts an end, um, when, sorry, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all all things under his feet but when he says all things are put under him it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted now when all things are made subject to him then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that god may be all in all okay so let's uh, let's look at that so he's saying verse 20 you know that that christ has been raised from the dead that's the reality Know, all of us have seen, right? You know, right from the apostles, right from those, uh, you know, all those 500 witnesses, and all these people, you know, and, and he also lists himself as one of the persons who had that encounter and has seen Jesus. So, uh, you know, if uh, so, he's saying that you know he is risen from the dead and he's become the first fruits. Meaning, the word used there is a Greek word which means uh, the beginning of something new. The beginning of something new. He's become the first fruits of um, of the new creation of the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay, so this is how it will be. Christ has risen. He's become the first fruits. The all the others will follow. Okay, beginning of something new. He's resurrected from the uh, from the dead, and um, he has received an incorruptible, spiritual, glorified body. Similarly, those who are Christ's, right, those who have received Christ, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, will also follow the same. He's the first fruit, and 
the others will also receive that. They will also be made alive. Um, so we have this confidence, right? So the resurrection of the Lord and what he received and how what he has become, right? It, uh, we are, uh, we are to follow. It represents our resurrection as well. It represents what will happen at his coming to us as well. Right. So, um, so you have to do that. Verse 24, 28. Um, then comes the end. Okay. He's referring to uh, the Lord's uh, millennial reign. All enemies will be brought under his, uh, brought under him. He'll bring an end to all rule, all, all nations, all authorities, uh, ev everything. And the last enemy, which is death, you know, Will also be um, will also be made redundant, right? It will be destroyed, and uh, and he says, you know, everything will be put under his feet. That, that uh, the Father will, um, that everything will be brought under the authority. So in Jesus, uh, we have this uh, resurrection uh, assurance that this will what will uh, will happen. Right. So Paul explains that uh, Christ is risen, and then there will come an end, and uh, you know He's the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at His coming, they will also follow and uh, become, you know, like the resurrected Christ, uh, glorified body. You know, we need to understand that He is deity. We are not. You know, it's not like you know. Sometimes we will say, you know, we will when we say, you know, we will become like Christ. We are finite beings. We need to understand that. That we had a beginning, whereas you know Christ is eternal. In the beginning was the Word, right? So He's eternal. Um, he is a pre-existent Christ. Um, so uh, in that way, we will be different. But in the resurrection, we will be like Him. Um, in our, you know, we will we would have received spiritual glorified bodies, right? And uh, we'll be like Him in that sense, right? Um, okay, let's. Um, Let's read verse 29. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. And if in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Okay. So um, he, uh, so Paul is, uh, you know, referring to some folks uh, and some practice which was done. Okay. So, so he's not. Uh, teaching the believers or he's not teaching the Corinthian church to do this practice but he's saying you know he's pointing to some practice which was there uh, uh, in in the in Corinth so he's saying you know why uh, you know what will they do who are baptized for the dead they are, they are like they are doing something for the sake of the dead okay so which means that uh, they believe that the dead will come to life at some point, right? So they are doing something for the sake of the dead. So they believe that there is life after death. So, uh, which means they believe that, you know, there is eternal life, that there is uh, resurrection and so on. So, so he's saying, you know, if that is happening, then why do they do that? Okay, don't you see that they, there is some kind of a custom that is there? Um, you know, why is that uh, some, you know, like that happening? Why, why is that custom that some baptism for baptism is happening for the sake of the dead. If the dead do not rise at all, why do they do that? You know, if, if the belief is that there is no resurrection, why do they do that? So he's pointing to one custom there, and he's talking about it. So we need to understand that he's not uh, teaching uh, about you know baptism for the sake of the dead. You know, he's not uh, he's not not in any way uh, teaching that or promoting that, right? Um, because he, he he's the one who says, says right like to be um, absent in the body is to be present with the Lord right so um, there's not there's no way that you can do something you know to 
to change that right the uh, the status uh, of those who are dead right those who are asleep in christ so anyway so he's saying you know why do they have this habit uh, if they why do they have this custom if the dead do not rise at all and why do we stand in jeopardy every day my life in danger jeopardy is danger right uh, and uh, why is it that i know i put my life in danger i'm being arrested i'm being persecuted uh, people are coming after me and he's saying you know i die daily you know there is which means that uh, you know there is this threat to my life which is uh, which is happening every day every moment right uh, and he's talking about uh, in Ephesus, um, he faced opposition, and it was as if, you know, he faced wild animals. You know, we, we read about that. Uh, there was so much. When you read the Book of Acts, we see that there was so much uh, persecution wherever he went, right? Uh, and especially in Ephesus, also. So he's saying that you know, if if that is the case, you know, why should I go through all this? Right? You understand that I'm going through all this, which means that he's saying, you know. There is the belief that there is eternal life. The belief of resurrection from the dead is so strong. Okay, now this, then then he talks about uh, you know how uh, in verse verses twenty twenty one onwards he talks about how you know by man death came, by Adam sin came into the world, and because of sin there was death. Therefore, by man meaning the Lord Jesus we have life. Right, so death. Uh, sin results in death and the Lord Jesus came so that we might have life and we see that in verse uh, verses 20 22 you know 23 and they, like he was resurrected from the dead and he is the first fruit which means the beginning of something new we also will follow right so he, he uh, talks about all that and they say you know I'm so convinced which means he's, he's saying you know I'm convinced of all this therefore I live my life like this so if I'm living my life like this if I put my life in danger you know why do I need to live like this every day just think about it right and he says do not be deceived you know we need to be careful you need to be careful about who you surround yourself with because who you surround yourself with and who you uh, you know move closely with uh, uh, or you uh, you know give have the ability to influence you Okay, whom you are in close contact with have the ability to influence you. So evil company corrupts good habits, right? So you believe something. We need, you know that you have, uh, you know, you have something uh, good happening, but you there is something like this happening. There, there is this teaching that you you have, you know, uh, you have um, permitted, and that is creating a change in your belief and uh, which is not correct is departure from the truth the truth is this right so um so what are some things there for us to you know apply you, you know we must live as people who are convinced in the fact that jesus is alive that jesus will come again that jesus rose from the dead and there is a resurrection from the dead that, that that's a great hope that we have you know um and over and over again, Paul talks about that. One Thessalonians, uh, you know, also Second Thessalonians talks about that. You know, this will this will happen that the dead will rise; those who are asleep in Christ will rise again. Second Corinthians also he talks about that. You know, our outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed every day. And uh, you know, uh, and we will receive uh, exceeding great uh, eternal weight of glory, and uh, you know, uh, and so on. So the reality of uh, death, burial, resurrection, you know, the reality of resurrection, you know, how strong is that? Right? Is that something that we are saying, okay, uh, you know, sometimes we think about that, no, we don't think about death because um, we think that it's very unpleasant. And uh, so we don't think about it. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, I'm going to live my life. But the fact is, as a believer, uh, we don't have to fear death. And as a believer, we need to be convinced about the resurrection from the dead. The eternal life that we have, right? We need to be convinced because this is the uh, truth, right? Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Okay, we'll stop here, and um, yeah, we will continue with this. Uh, we'll continue with chapter fifteen uh, in our next class. Okay, so have a good weekend. God bless. Um, we'll see you again next week. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank okay. you.
see you goodbye god bless